Greetings and thank you for joining me on this lovely Friday morning um, or early afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to be super brief and um, also uh, super helpful in presenting to you um, some key information about fourth declension nouns, which is our grammar focus in Lesson 68. Um, I just want to say something very, very quickly. Um, in our new textbook series, um, our Latin II students learned them in um, uh, Chapter 18, did, doing that uh, in April, early April. Um, I'm sorry that it's been such a delay in your education um, presenting to you fourth declension nouns, um, but I would also like to say if Latin II students can master them, so can you. All right, um, as we get moving forward, I am going to present to you a couple, uh, to actually three phrases of the day. Uh, the first of them, mens et manus, is the motto of MIT, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as you can no doubt read. Um, and of course, as an institution that is not just about um, pure knowledge um, or the discovery of pure knowledge or the passing on of pure knowledge, but is very much about its application in um, new technological um, and practical applications. Um, this is the perfect motto for a, an institution like MIT. And you're pretty smart, so you can probably translate it, especially if you've done some preliminary reading in the vocab in Lesson 68. Um, and yes, it does mean mind and hand. All right. Uh, one of these nouns, manos, is a fourth declension noun. Um, the information presented in the textbook is um, accurate about fourth declension nouns, um, but it is not necessarily complete. And so I'm going to encourage you to um, make some uh, notes from this presentation at this point. Um, this presentation will also give you opportunities to practice, which I suggest you do by pausing the video and uh, doing some information in your, adding some information to your notes. All right, pat, facts about the fourth declension. Um, the genitive ending long us, and yes, that macron is important, is the marker of this declension. Um, it's not short is, it's not long i, it's not ae, um, which are the markers of the genitive of the first, second, and third declension in reverse order. The genitive ending is long us. And that becomes really, really important to observe because, um, as you may have already deduced, uh, manus, M-A-N-U-S, that lovely fourth declension noun, um, is, on the basis of its nominative, totally indistinguishable from, say, for example, corpus, meaning body, or equus, meaning horse. So attention to learning the genitive, very important, and get used to it, and it's a long U.S. for the fourth declension. Long U.S. brings up the point that attention to macrons is really important. It's a right or wrong kind of thing. Uh, it's a survival tactic, um, if you will, if you're pessimistic. Um, in terms of learning the fourth declension, it's also a, a, a marker of excellence, um, not just of survival. Be attentive to the macrons. I'm also um, soon going to be presenting to you a full chart of the endings. Within the fourth declension, many of the endings repeat. And therefore, when we start seeing these nouns in sentences, in our exercises, in the readings, attention to contextual clues is very, very important. So if there's an adjective describing the fourth declension noun, um, that adjective may well be an indication of whether the noun is nominative or accusative. Um, singular or plural. Also, um, as always, verb forms are of um, tremendous importance in establishing context. Within the fourth declension, uh, the masculine gender predominates. I will amplify um, that statement by saying um, there are, in effect, as, as far as all intents and purposes um, for uh, Latin students going forward, only five exceptions to this rule. So 
<clears throat> the vast majority are going to be masculine and gender. There are two really important feminine exceptions. Manos, meaning hand. Domus, meaning home or house. Um, but just to clarify, it's not a house out in the countryside uh, or back Paucus and Philemon's house. It's a domus, a formal living structure for an upper-class Roman in the city. So manus and domus are feminine. There are three uh, neuter, um, fourth declension nouns. Um, genu is important because it means knee, K-N-E-E. -E. You know, the thing that allows you to bend and move and run and wrestle and so on. Um, and it's not the knee that the knights who say knee say, but K-N-E-E. -E. Uh, cornu means horn. Um, and it's in cornucopia, the horn of plenty. Um, also, for those of you who play the cornet or um, have an interest in instrumental music, uh, it derives from cornu. And then the word weiru, um, it means a skewer or a spit on which uh, meat is roasted. Long and short of it, you're not going to be needing to learn the neuter exceptions um, in this lesson. Um, this is something that I will elaborate more upon when we are together in the future. Uh, many masculine fourth declension nouns um, like exercitus and casos, which are part of this lesson's vocabulary, uh, derive from the fourth principal part of verbs. They're essentially the fourth principal part of a verb um, converted into a fourth declension noun. And uh, again, I will need to explain that more to you um, when we are together in the future. Um, again, that asterisk is accurate. I'm only going to ask you to give attention to the masculine and feminine forms uh, of fourth declension nouns this year. No worrying about the neuter. All right. Um, I am going to encourage you to get these endings in your notes. As usual, um, the textbook does not include the vocative in the chart. Um, but these are the endings for masculine or feminine fourth declension nouns. You're going to make some observations about um, how important the letter U is in this declension. Yes, this declension is all about U. Ha ha ha, that was funny. Um, sometimes the U is long, uh, like on the genitive singular us, and on the nominative plural us, and the accusative plural us, and the vocative plural us. Sometimes the U is short. As I've asked you to do, please be attentive to macrons. And please also note how many of these endings repeat, not just the nice normal repetition of the dative and ablative plural being identical, but we can see us in this chart four times. Thus the importance um, going forward of contextual clues. If you haven't got these endings into your notes, uh, please do so now, pausing the video and then resuming when you're ready. I'm ready for a second phrase of the day. Um, this is going to be pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? Um, don't be di uh, disturbed by the Greek uh, characters um, accompanying the illustration. Um, this is a an extremely old proverbial saying, um, and uh, I'm sure you can translate it because you're just that smart. Um, on a very, very literal level, when Seneca used this phrase to describe the exchange of mutual favors, um, kind of in the vein of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And don't worry, I'm not actually going to scratch your back. That would be weird. Um, but in, the, in that vein, uh, manus manum lawat means literally hand washes hand. Um, in English, we tend to say, whoops, we tend to say one hand washes the other um, when we are discussing the exchange of mutual favors. All right, um, onwards. I would like you uh, to uh, imagine the need to 
decline the masculine force declension noun exercitus exercitus. It's a masculine noun that means an army, um, not just any old army though, not a militia, not a ragtag group of people um, that uh, just come together to fight, but a fully trained army um, made up potentially on the Roman side of multiple legions. Anyway, I'm monologuing. Um, go ahead and get some written practice in your notes. Um, pause the video, write out the declension, and then when you're ready to check your, your work, um, press play on the video again. Yay, I bet you did a great job. So here is the noun trained army, or just army, in the uh, full declension within um, all cases and all numbers. And what I'd like to suggest that you do now, after you check your work, pausing the video as you need to to make improvements, is think about potentially choosing to describe this noun, army, with the adjective meaning good. You know, bonus, bona, bonum. Um, remember, exercitus is a masculine noun. Um, and that bonus bona bonum uses first and second declension endings. Um, if you would, what I'd suggest that you do is focus on the endings that repeat multiple times in this chart. So, um, for example, when you look at exercitus and exercitus, and then exercitus, 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 exercitus. Um, think about, in particular, describing those forms uh, with the adjective good, bonus, bona, bonum. Maybe scribble them, in, if you have enough room, uh, next to the form of the word meaning army. A reason for asking you to do this is because, woohoo, um, I want to prime you to be on the lookout for um, noun adjective agreement as a way to help you determine which case and number of a particular word form you're encountering. So if you describe the army as good or armies plural as good in those places I suggested where the endings repeat, um, do so. If you've already done that, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, if not, or sorry, keep pressing play. Uh, if you haven't, um, maybe pause and work that out, because here come the answers. I'm going to put in the spotlight, um, obviously with, with highlighting, um, the places where we are most likely to see maybe semi-ambiguous endings um, on the fourth declension nouns the nominative singular and the genitive singular, the nominative plural and the accusative plural. We're not going to see the vocative for these nouns very often. Um, what I'm hoping to do with the highlighting is, is put into the spotlight, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is put into the spotlight um, these highlighted forms where if you're not attentive to the macron on exercitus, exer or exercitus um, you might not um, succeed in decoding um, its form without taking a look at the accompanying adjective. Um, I can't do much about the fact that the genitive singular um, is identical in appearance to the nominative plural, um, but you know that you can use context often to make that differentiation. The thing I would say, though, is when it comes to nominative and accusative plural, um, the noun forms are identical, but the adjective forms aren't. And so being attentive to those as offering contextual clues is a wonderful thing. All right, um, let's push on to uh, one more phrase of the day. Um, this is an oldie and a goodie, um, and I, I apologize uh, for uh, being slow and making things work. I just want to turn off that.
focus feature. Oh well, can't seem to turn it off. Um, there's Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And um, today's phrase of the day, casus belli, um, is one that I threw at you way back in, in the day when we were learning uh, bellum belli, meaning war. Um, what I'm asking you guys to do, though, is to give your focus to the word casus. Um, without being as long-winded as I could, casus comes from, as a fourth declension noun, the participial stem of cado, cadere, kikidi, casus, a verb we saw recently that means fall. Casus is a noun formed from that that has a wonderful meaning. It means downfall, like we could talk about the downfall of um, buggy whips as a um, uh, commercial product when automobiles were invented. It means accident, like when something falls in your lap, um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it falls into your lap metaphorically by accident. It means chance, so how things fall in a competition or whatever is sometimes the product of chance. And on the dark side of that, it means misfortune. So a chance event that is unwanted, casos. The other thing I'd like you to picture, though, is um, if you look at the illustration, artillery shells and mortars uh, falling on Fort Sumter. Or in the Roman context, um, I'd like you to picture the fall, the motion downwards of a sword that is being brought down on um, the armor or the flesh of an enemy. And an additional meaning that I would like you to put into your brain for Casos is the meaning stroke. Like the stroke of a sword, um, not the affectionate stroke you give your puppy or your hamster or your, your kitty cat, okay? um, but a stroke of, from a weapon that is falling downward with force upon an enemy. That's where this phrase of the day comes into play. The stroke of war, literally, is my preferred translation of this. Um, some people translate it as the cause of a war, which is totally wrong. Uh, we're not going to debate the causes of the Confederacy's attack on Fort Sumter. But the first stroke of war, the first falling of weapons on a Union or United States military base, uh, happened at Fort Sumter. And um, this phrase, casus belli, whoops, is regularly used to describe the first incident of violence that marks the official start of hostilities in a war. So for example, the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, um, the, I, I suppose we could say, um, the uh, flying of the airplanes into the Pentagon and the Twin Towers um, and the attempted, uh, uh, sorry, the attempted attack on the uh, uh, never mind. My, my brain is, is empty. All right. So sorry for uh, ending on that empty headed note. Um, the message is done. Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, go to your learning. Ciao, ciao.